my full-time job is actually in faculty at UNO School of Social Work, and um, I have a practice on the side um, called Clear Mind Therapy over in Iowa. So I am a licensed independent social worker. I'm a clinician, and um, <clears throat> but my real role is full-time faculty. I can relate hard to those emails, um, and def I always do that. I'm, I'm all about documentation that I tried, so I definitely am like, um, you know, these are the areas you could have improved. I would love to have an in-person conversation with you so we can go over that. So I, I was like, oh yes, those emails every semester. So, um, <clears throat> all right, so just a little bit about who I am. Um, I've already talked briefly about that. They keep me busy at UNO. So I am uh, the BSW, uh, so the undergraduate program coordinator and the admissions chair. So uh, I do a lot of really cool administrative stuff there. Our MSW um, <clears throat> coordinator, Dr. Uh, Carrie Belden, is going on medical leave, so I will be moving up to the MSW coordinator here soon. And um, they just really think that because I don't have a PhD that they need to give me more things to do. Um, but yeah, yeah, so that's always super fun. Uh, you have to prove your own right. Uh, but I specialize in suicide, uh, suicide education, um, assessment, risk assessment, outreach, loss, uh, grief and loss, things like that. Um, I did all my schooling in Kansas, thought I was being a rebel going out of state when uh, Kansas is no different than Nebraska. So um, uh, that was my way of, of being rebellious and um, putting myself more into debt for out-of-state tuition. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I got um, my MSW from, uh, my undergrad is in psych and women's studies, and then my MSW is from KU in adult mental health. And um, like I said, I am the co-owner of Clear Mind Therapy over in Council Bluffs, and um, I'm from the Crescent, Iowa area. Does anyone know where that's at? Just north of Council Bluffs, uh, right across the river on 680. <clears throat> I have a partner, his name is Sean, and we have... Um, two uh, little boys. Declan, he just turned five actually, so now he's five and Camden two and a half. And something I'm going to talk about today is I'm also a suicide attempt survivor. So um, I think that creates a really interesting dynamic in my life. Um, I speak a lot about it, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, uh, what that looks like, what that experience was like for me, um, what worked, what didn't work when I was trying to attain wellness, and um, what it's like kind of being on that client, that patient side, and then moving into becoming a professional. Um, and I ded currently dedicate a lot of my time to um, suicide initiatives and research and um, hopefully I'll be getting a PhD. I'm applying um, this fall. Um, in gerontology to um, study suicide in the aging population. So uh, it's a very big part of my life, and hopefully you all learned something today about suicide or how to respond to people who have lost someone to suicide or had a suicide attempt. So, um, oh, who are you all? I know we've been mentioning nurses, medical staff. It's so nice to be back at Methodist. I worked at Methodist for four years, PRN, social worker at Jenny Ed Edmondson Psych Services, and um, I absolutely loved working there. So um, we've got nurses, CNA, physicians, and then school, right? Um, yeah, the Methodist Hospital Community Counseling. Oh, Community Counseling. Okay, so some of you look very familiar to me. My best friend is Mary-Kate Hoffman. Oh, wow. Yes. Mary-Kate Mary -Kate is my best friend. So text her and say your best friend. Yeah, right. Um, so she did uh, community counseling, and um, she's now at UNO. And so her and I are just all nestled up together, love and life. Um, it's really cool to work right across the street from your best friend. So, um, And she's my person. My partner does not get it. He's a finance guy for that whole self-care thing Melissa was talking about. He's like, what? Helping people, that sounds awful. Um, he's like, let me do a budget. But uh, I have people like Mary Kate in my life, um, people who I'm especially close to, so that, that's helpful. Why I do this work, these are my boys. I call these the candid photos because they're real, right? This is like normal day, like normal stuff versus the facade that people put on social media of like beautiful families and that we have nothing wrong in our lives. 
So this is them being silly. This is Camden pressing his face up against a, a glass window and Declan just demanding to wear construction glasses to breakfast and um, grumpy faces. But I do this work because I have two sons. Um, and although not a marginalized population whatsoever in our culture, um, but middle-aged white males are killing themselves at a much higher rate than anyone else in this country. And I am raising two white males. So um, that's a concern of mine, uh, having two males in um, this particular culture and country where access to suicide, uh, completion, and ultimately the stressors and things that are going on with this particular population, um, they're at high risk for all of those things. So um, definitely... Uh, okay, so this is the cute stuff, right? Now I'm going to show you the stuff that like people post to pretend their life's perfect. But um, this took a lot of work. Okay, <laughs> a lot of work. All right, a lot of bribing, a lot of, yeah. So um, my family in the one photo up of Sean. <laughs> so, okay, um, before I get started, I like to just inform a little bit of people, a little bit um, to people about language and data. Because I think there's still a ton of misconceptions out there about the issue of suicide. I also think that we talk about it in a very shaming, stigmatized way. And um, the data is really um, moving, if you really take a look at it. It's very moving. And the thing is, um, with data, is that it doesn't even represent the reality of suicide because so many causes of death are actually recorded as accidents when many are actually suicides, such as certain overdoses, car accidents, things like that. Um, many were actually suicides, but they're unable to prove that and therefore ruled accidents. So our data on suicide, even though it is still very alarming for what we have, is, is grossly underestimated, okay? <clears throat> So I think it's always just a good starting point so that you kind of know um, a little more about the issue and, and why um, it is a public health issue. So um, language of suicide, you'll hear me say suicidal ideation. Majority of you know what that means. So thinking about considering or even planning for suicide. There is two um, different tiers of, of suicidal ideation in the clinical world. There's passive and then there's active. So active and passive. Passive ideation are really um, nonchalant passive comments like the world would be better off without me. I wish I wouldn't wake up in the morning. Things like that. Active is when people are actively thinking about a plan and want to die by suicide. Okay? So um, those are two very different things and um, alarming in the sense that if you're active, right, we're going to do something more clinical intervention. We're going we're to pay attention to those things. When you hear the term lived experience or attempt survivor, that is someone who has attempted suicide and survived. So um, please uh, try to avoid the usage of um, successful and unsuccessful because any suicide attempt should never be related to the word success. Okay, so um, they made an unsuccessful attempt. E I get it, and we've always talked about suicide that way, but it, it should, success has nothing to do with it, okay? So um, I just encourage you to try to change your language as we talk about this. It took me a long time. I'm not going to, like, freak out if you say committed, uh, which I'm going to talk about in a second, or if you say successful. It, it takes a while to change your language because we're surrounded by it day, day to day. Um, but it's just something to be mindful of, especially if you're working with someone who's almost died from suicide or if you're working from a, with a bereaved family who has lost someone to suicide. Suicide survivor, now that is different than an attempt survivor. So that is someone who's just lost someone to suicide, someone that they care about, okay? It doesn't have to be a family member. It could just be anyone that they care about. <clears throat> so, oops, uh, commit versus died of or died by, okay? We are removing the word commit from suicide research and language because it's stigmatizing, Okay, so commit is often used in our language when we're referring to someone committing a crime or committing a sin. So naturally stigmatizing, there's a whole history about that too I could go into, but 
I have a short amount of time here with you today. Um, but language is powerful, whether we reali realize it or not. And unfortunately, in the mental health field, suicide has developed that committed. And um, media and reporting outlets still very much use that in their methods of reporting about suicide, which we're trying to encourage them to change. Um, and so you're hearing people say they died of suicide or died by suicide, died of cancer, died of... You know. So we're trying to really... Eat, um, make that playing field a little more level um, when we're talking about mental health and physical health. Um, okay, so data, most accurate we have, but uh, it's probably a lot higher. These are just shock value, right? <laughs> so each year, over 44,000 Americans die by suicide. That's on average 123 people a day. Um, suicide rates have increased um, significantly, 1999 to 2017, with greater annual percent increases after 2006. So I want to talk about that real quickly. Um, data regarding suicide has usually been really consistent. If you look over decades of data, um, you've got, uh, for the most part, every decade, so every 10 years or so, you see any increase trends. And then it goes for a lull. And then an increase, and then a lull. So over over a long period of time, suicide data is pretty consistent. Um, now, what is concerning researchers, especially those in public health, because public health, the centers, the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, is um, they're the people who take all of that data in regarding suicide. Since 2006, um, you know, suicide has gone up, right? And we've been waiting for it to go back down. N usual nat natural trend, but it has not. So it just keeps going up and going up. And all these scientists are sitting back, and these clinicians going, "Okay, so when is it going to? When are we going to start seeing the the natural decrease that we usually see?" And that has not occurred. And we're two years in. So that's really concerning, and now it's getting more public health attention, and we all know if public health gets involved, we get more funding. So we're okay with that, but we're not okay with suicide rates going up, right? Um, suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. Homicide is 16. So we hear a lot more about homicide um, than we do about suicide. For every completed suicide, at least 25 people have attempted and um, again, this is, I don't even like to really put a number to, to vet suicide um, because that's really hard to track because um, there's so much stigma in that field. Um, but on average, 22 a day. I would say much more. Most are men. Most are middle-aged very high in those middle-aged men who identify as American Indian or Alaska Native. Compared to their population rates, compared to ours, their rates are much, much higher. There's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, you can ask me about that later if you'd like. Um, and over half are with firearms. All right, so um, lots of stuff up here, right? The green is suicide. Uh, causes of death, this was in 2014, it's pretty much the same, um, current data. So second leading cause of death, age 10 to 35. Concerning. All right, I like to show this because um, it shows the power of um, information, education, and funding. And that's the social work side of me. <laughs> so bear with me for a hot second. Uh, if we look, I'm going to show you Nebraska as well. If we look at Iowa data 2016, um, we've got second leading cause of death in Iowa for age 15 to 34. Third leading cause, age 10 to 14. Um, then, so that's pretty normal in Iowa. The next year, pretty much the same. Right, Iowa, there's not a whole lot going on over there in that regard. Then we look at Nebraska last year or two years ago. 
the leading cause of death for our youth age 10 to 14 was suicide in the state of Nebraska. Okay, and that's confirmed by the CDC. Leading cause of death age 10 to 14 in Nebraska two years ago was suicide. Second leading cause of death in Nebraska was age 15 to 34. All right, so uh, policymakers, clinicians, people all over the state saw this and panicked, okay? And when um, people who have power and money see that our youth are dying by suicide, they make things happen. So a lot of people really pushed this data toward policymakers and got some good funding funneled into Region 6 and other regions throughout the state, but Region 6 did a lot with it. And did a lot of prevention, outreach, started a suicide coalition, a loss team, um, did a lot of really great things in the area. And in a year, it dropped to seventh. I'm not saying that's the number one cause, right? Because there are so many different things that impact suicide rates in a state. But I think that's telling that it was the leading cause of death. And then when people took notice of data, and was like, this is a problem, they did something about it. So very cool, very proud of Nebraska for making that change. Um, I also want to just make, I think this is an important note. I get a lot of questions about this, either before, after, um, in between. What about LGBTQIA spectrum? Or some people use the terminology trans queer youth spectrum. Um, what about them? What's going on with them in suicide? We always hear, aren't they high risk? Aren't they dying by suicide more frequently? Um, yes, they are more high risk. Yes, they're having more attempts. No, we do not have data on whether they're actually dying by suicide because there's nothing to put on a death certificate, your gender identity or um, sexual orientation. So that's hard to track that data. But I think it's very relevant, especially for our school um, uh, clinicians, uh, because they always want to know, are they higher risk? Are they dying by? Absolutely. Higher risk, for sure. Um, so what's it like being suicidal? Uh, sometimes this can be very difficult to be empathic toward, right? Um, and I understand that. As a suicide attempt survivor, I take no, no offense in that. Um, I think it's very difficult for people to empathize with being suicidal, primarily because it's so stigmatized in our culture. And if you have religious beliefs that say, if you kill yourself, you're selfish and you're going to hell, <laughs> that's a huge contributor, right? So um, I absolutely understand why it can be difficult to empathize with this. But lots of research shows that there are literal brain changes happening to people who become suicidal, that there are a lot of neurobiogenetical components to people who ultimately die by suicide. More research is coming out that there's a chromosome and alleles on there that people have two short SS alleles are much more likely to die by suicide, um, that there are actual neurobiogenetic stuff going on up here that puts people at much higher risk of dying by suicide. As with cancer, diabetes, heart disease, right? Many of us have genetic predispositions. Now, whether that gene is going to be expressed is largely due to environmental, right? So same with mental health, absolute same with mental health. Not just suicide, but depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, things that impact people in their brains. Okay, this is definitely a brain issue. Um, a lot of people, when they get to this point, um, feel in crisis in that they want to end emotional pain. And that can actually cause um, depression, typically, will cause a brain change to where that seems logical, that suicide seems logical, that people will be better off without me. Okay? There's this really, really great theory in suicide um, that Joyner has developed, and it's the most progressive up-to-date because everyone goes back to Schneidman, who developed his theory about suicide in, like, the 1800s, because nobody wants to study suicide. Surprise, surprise. Um, 
But Joyner came up with this really cool theory that has been, is being closer to being almost proven. Um, we don't like to say proven in science, right? Um, but he is saying that most people, if you have perceived burdensomeness, so you perceive yourself as a burden, thwarted belongingness, science jargon, right? Meaning, I do not feel connected to people. If you have those two things, okay, that's a deadly combination in itself. And then if you have acquired capability, meaning you have endured some things throughout your life that made you more fearless of death, then you are much more likely to die by suicide. So I think those are really important things that we need to be thinking about. Now, I could teach a six-week course on just that theory. What does uh, thwarted belongingness and perceived burdensomeness and acquired capability even really mean, right? Um, tons of, of literature about that. Now, acquired capability is complex. It could be childhood trauma. It could be PTSD, childhood abuse, neglect. It can be past suicide attempts. Number one correlation to dying by suicide is past suicide attempts. Number one correlator right there. So high risk, high risk. Um, those type of things are considered acquired capability. Physicians, EMTs, people, nurses, people who encounter trauma and death on the daily, much higher acquired capability. Physicians kill themselves at a much higher rate than any other profession. The whole dentist thing, that's not true. That's physicians. Physicians, especially ER doctors, because they see the most trauma, okay? Because they have more acquired capability. So um, people are always wondering, like, why? It must just be high stress. No, it's not just high stress. It's, they're seeing death on the regular. It makes them f more fearless to death and more at resolve with dying. They're okay with that. And one of my best friends is an ER doctor, a male. So I'm always checking in with him. I'm like, hey, have you read this? <laughs> He's a UNMC uh, ER doctor, and he also teaches there. And I'm always like, you need to teach your students about this. He's like, Sierra, you just need to back off about the suicide. <laughs> Okay, so I am going to kind of just run through this one quickly because I think um, discussion and questions are the best way to learn, right? So um, my story, uh, I do s completely separate presentations on this in general, but I'm really comfortable telling my story now, and it does not, um, I'm an open book, so please do not feel like um, you can ask the wrong question or say the wrong thing. Um, that is not a concern of mine. Please, at any time, if you want to ask me to elaborate, um, give more feedback, I'm more than willing to do that. What I like to do in telling my story is connecting it to research and data that supports what happened to me. Okay? So, oh, you know, we all love visuals. And um, that is me as a toddler living in Louisiana in the South, if you couldn't tell. Thank you, Mom, for that beautiful hat. So I was actually born in Bellevue, Nebraska. Um, my dad was military, so um, we were uh, off it, and that's where I was born. And then we went to Fort Polk in Louisiana, and we were re relocated there for a while. I'm the youngest of three children, and... Um, significant age gaps, like my sister's 12 years older than me. I never really felt like the youngest. <clears throat> um, I think I had a pretty average childhood, and um, I was pretty quiet, kind of sensitive, introverted, creative, and morbid. I say morbid because that's another thing with acquired capability in children. Um, so who all remembers the TV series ER? George Clooney? Okay, so um, loved it. My mom loved it, and uh, we would always watch it together as a kid. Probably not the most appropriate for some of my age, but um, loved it, and I became obsessed with death and medicine when I was young. 
I always wanted to actually be a doctor, but then you have to be good at math, and I'm not good at math. So I would like take my Barbies and put them in car accidents <laughs> and lipstick and put it all over for blood, and then I'd wrap wet toilet paper around their legs and let it dry, and it would be casts. So um, I had like this early uh, exposure to death dying like that was not anything weird and I'm not saying that's going to make your kids become suicidal so please do not take that from this I'm just saying that I had a different type of personality and characteristics that looking back on at hindsight makes a lot more sense now um okay so depression uh began in early middle school uh, we all develop our mental health diagnoses early 20s, right? People typically struggle, but kids struggle way before that, and we know that, right? They start struggling sometimes late elementary school, early middle school, um, and I was one of those. I always just kind of felt like I was isolated, separate, different, um, but I adjusted well, but internally, so intrinsically, I didn't feel that great, but extrinsically, I did okay. Okay, so you don't always know what's going on. I did. Now everyone's always like, where's the trauma? Tell me the trauma. Where did the trauma happen? Um, I did experience sexual abuse at the age of 12 from one of my brother's friends. My brother's significantly older than me. So, yes, that is a trauma of mine. And, yes, it was impactful. And I didn't tell anyone until, like, graduate school. But I don't think that it caused me to spiral by any means. Okay? It definitely wasn't was influential and impactful, but um, what I did is I became a perfectionist, right? I started to control things in my life. I became overly involved, and we all know these kids, right? And these are the kids who die by suicide, and we're always like, we didn't see it coming. They had so many friends. They were so good at sports and, and charismatic, and okay? So that happens. That's real, and that happens. Um, does it happen a ton? Not really, but it does happen. Uh, so I was overly active. Arts, writing, sports, you name it. Um, I put some quotes up here because I think that they uh, explain depression or describe it really well. So the thing about depression, a human being can survive almost anything as long as she or he or them sees the end in sight. But depression is so insidious and it compounds daily that it's impossible to ever see the end. So I think this is just highlights some of the biological changes in the brain that makes people unable to see the light at the end of the tunnel, because I think that's very real. People talk about that, and I think it's very real. Okay, this is where things started to go downhill quickly. I went out of state, so I removed a lot of my connectedness, right? Went out of state, went to Kansas State. That's a real picture of me. Um, freshman year of college right there. I do not remember that picture because I was self-medicating with alcohol. Um, I was missing classes, not attending classes, basically drinking five days out of the week, binge drinking, um, and I was wildly depressed. Okay, So I had a lot of stress going on. I did a little bit of therapy, hated it, didn't want to go back. Um, Tried some really basic medication, maybe some Prozac, some Zoloft, hated it, didn't go back. And um, then, I, then that's when suicide started to enter my mind. I'm out of control. I don't know how to deal with this. People would be better off without me because I kept making bad decisions when I was intoxicated, as most people do, right? You make a lot of mistakes. You make bad decisions. And um, all of these events compounded in my life. So that's when the suicidal thinking came. Looking back, my warning signs, we always talk about risk factors, warning signs, protective factors. Um, mine included dramatic increase of alcohol, acting recklessly. Like I would drive fast, not wear a seatbelt, not worry about those type of things, you know, things that you typically wouldn't be doing. Erratic sleeping and eating habits. Had lots of these feelings. And I couldn't quite pinpoint why, which compounds the feeling of being depressed. And then looking for and researching ways to kill myself. That is a very common thing that's going on with our youth. Because Google, 
as great as it is, is a rabbit hole for people who are suicidal. There are pro-suicide websites out there that tell people how to kill themselves and encourage people to kill themselves. So lots of really not so great resources out there on how to effectively kill yourself and not leave yourself maimed or damaged. Because we all who have worked in the medical field have seen that, right? We've seen people try to shoot themselves and just blow off half their face. Or people who overdose and don't die and then they have system problems for the rest of their lives. So um, nowadays, there are resources out there telling people how to effectively, and you know I don't like using um, positive language with that, kill themselves. Okay, so I really liked this because this is how I felt, I would say, probably a month or two before I, I attempted. I didn't want my picture taken because I was going to cry. I didn't know why I was going to cry, but I knew that if anyone spoke to me or looked at me too closely, the tears would fly out of my eyes and the sobs would fly out of my throat and I'd cry for a week. I could feel the tears brimming and sloshing in me like water in a glass that is unsteady and too full. So I think that speaks to me because I also felt very vulnerable, but if someone would have really sat down with me and said, do you need help? It all would have come out. But instead it was, she's acting out and being reckless and it's annoying. Okay? So that's another thing that I think we get lost in is how is this person impacting me? And it's making me upset, right? And when usually people are screaming for help. Or I hear a lot of families that I've worked with who have chronic suicide attempters, um, typically people with bipolar disorder or borderline personality disorder. Oh, it's just a cry for, cry for help. Just looking for attention again. They're just looking for attention. And I go, yeah, you're right. They are. They are. They need something. There's something, there's a need there that hasn't been met. So we're saying it, but then we're ignoring it. Okay, so there's a need that needs to be met that hasn't been met. And resistant, non-compliant people, I teach my students this all the time, resistance and non-compliance is pain avoidance. Okay, so we like to say you're resistant. You're not compliant. Yes, it's pain avoidance. I'm avoiding pain. Because there's something about it that gives me pain, whether it be emotional, physical, whatever, psych pain. Okay? Yes? Great question. Yes, so thank you for asking, um, because I do talk a little bit about that here in a second and how people responded to a lot of that. Um, so my family was in Iowa and had no idea <laughs> what was going on. So I was like, things are great, Mom and Dad. You know, and so they were like, well, okay, great. You know, and I had always been a good student in high school. And so they didn't think that this was happening. Now, my peers, I was in a peer group that was very socially focused. So binge drinking was a norm for them. So... Um, the drinking wasn't that much of a problem um, to my friends. But then they started to notice after so long I was doing reckless things. I would become wildly depressed and crying and things like that. Um, make suicidal gestures. So what I mean by that, um, I lived on like an 8, 10 floor dor dormitory. Someone found me intoxicated sitting out on a window ledge one time on the 8th floor. And I was so intoxicated. That's suicidal gesture. You know, I'm thinking about it. I'm practicing. I need help. Very concerning to housing staff, to my friends. So, yeah, they were checking in, but they didn't know what to do. You know, they felt really helpless. They weren't quite sure how to handle all of that. Um, I did have a high school sweetheart at the time, and we were still together. And I'll talk very briefly about that. Um, he knew something was really wrong, and he tried to help me. But um, 
uh, by the time that that help came, I was so far into, I think I'm going to end my life. And we'll talk about that to you in a second. So good question. Suicidal trance. So there's this really cool book um, called Waking Up Alive by Richard Heckler. And um, if you're ever interested in learning more about people who ha- think about suicide or have attempted suicide and what it was like for them, um, this book is really fascinating. He did a ton of research and did qualitative interviews with people who had survived suicide attempts and put together basically this is what it's like for them. This is what has happened. Um, he says that a lot of people have kind of a suicidal trance before they have a serious attempt, okay? So I'm not talking about those impulsive attempts. I'm talking about the more thought out, um, usually completions, um, or near fatal attempts, okay? So a suicidal trance, and um, I would definitely attest to this. So I had two very minor attempts before my near fatal, and they were more impulsive, not very serious, in that I knew that it wasn't lethal. Now, my near-fatal attempt what, that I talk about, um, I think, is very powerful in the sense that I definitely was in a trance. And what I mean by that is I was at peace. Nothing was scary to me. I had made up my mind. It wasn't dramatic. It wasn't scary. It just wasn't what a lot of people think, right? Um, It was detailed, planned out, fine. There was nothing really stopping me, okay? And I really, truly believe that a lot of people, not all, a lot of people who die by suicide endure this trance. And I really think it's a defense mechanism to follow through on death because it's natural for us to fight death. It's a human nature to fight death. So... Um, this is what Heckler says. He says, when hope finally dies, people no longer see or hear anything outside their own minds, the tight spiral of thought that tells them to die. While this shift may occur just moments before a suicide attempt, it could be months or years in the making. And this is another example. The story of suicide begins with loss or trauma, typically for a lot of people, an unbridgeable sense of alienation and a deep need to hide one's pain. Withdrawal begins and then deepens. Eventually, the person who was once here is no longer present. She may still live in our homes and eat at our our table, but she only goes through the motions of living. Hiding behind a facade, the person is isolated and vulnerable to the urgings of the suicidal trance. Unchecked, the trance draws him or her to one fatal choice. So I like that because I think it definitely speaks to my experience. Okay. Um, So this is my suicidal ideation for my uh, near-fatal attempt. There's a condition versus catalyst theory, which I don't really even think it's a theory. I think it's, um, it's real. So people don't die because of bad events. People don't die because of a divorce don't kill themselves because of a breakup, that's a catalyst, okay? They die of conditions. So conditions are typically underlying, untreated, or improperly treated mental health illness, illness, mental health issues, okay? Um, That is a condition. And most people, almost all, most people had some sort of condition going on before a catalyst, Okay? And whether people didn't see this or not is where people feel confused after a suicide. <clears throat> so I have worked with a lot of bereaved families for those who have lost someone to suicide. And they're like, I just didn't, this is, I'm blindsided. I, I just didn't see it coming. And then the more that we investigate, the more that we talk, there were warning signs. There was a condition going on, but maybe this person didn't see it, or the family didn't see it, but the friends did, or they were seeing a therapist and nobody knew it. So the therapist knew something. You know, there's usually something. There's usually a condition going. And when you've got the grounds, right, when you've got the condition, you've got it all laid out, you need a catalyst sometimes, and all you need is one simple catalyst to put you into that, that state of mind, okay? And it usually is loss, 
relationship loss, job loss, um, identity loss, some sort of catalyst, okay? Someone dies. It could be a, a variation of things. So sophomore year of college, I returned home back to Iowa for spring break. And I was, I'd broke up with my boyfriend, my long-term boyfriend of four years. Poor guy. Man, I put him through the ringer while I was struggling with my condition. And, you know, but we were still friends. I went over to his house, and I was like, hey, um, I don't think I should go back to school. So he knew something was wrong, right? He was checking in with me. He had dealt with all of this stuff. And I pushed, pushed, said, no, no, no. Then I had a vulnerable moment, and I said to him, because I knew he cared, because he always told me he did, I said, listen, I don't think I should go back to school. I think I need to stay home for the rest of the semester because I think I'm going to kill myself. Whew. Someone tells you that, that's huge, huge. This poor guy, and I do not blame him for anything because he was a rock. He was a rock star. He had no prior experience with mental health, and he was always a good support. And God bless his heart today. We still keep him in touch. And I say, you know, I talk about you in my lectures and things. And he goes, oh, Lord. So um, he, and I, I'm sorry for the language, but I don't like to censor things. But he, he told me, and he was fed up. You know, he was scared. And he goes, gee, Sierra, if you're going to kill yourself, just do it already. Right? So. If you've ever loved someone with a mental health disorder who's maybe had multiple attempts, I'm sure you've felt that before, and that's okay. He felt that. But for me, that was my catalyst. The one person who I thought really, really loved me and cared about me, and I'm going to be vulnerable, and I'm going to say, you know what, I don't think I can make it. I need to stay home. And he says, I don't care if you die. Just do it. Tired of hearing about it. That's when my trance hit. Okay? I left. I was upset. And I, um, he knew I was upset. So that was dramatic in that sense. And um, that's when I had a very serious attempt. I had done my research. I, will, I won't go into details because that's not good practice, but I did have a, an overdose. I'll be very clear about that. But I'm not stupid in that I know overdoses are not very lethal unless you do a certain amount and there's a procedure and what you take and all of that. And I had looked all of that up, and I have known that. And I want summer, isolated myself, and I was definitely in a trance. Nothing stopped me. I felt at peace. I actually felt like a weight had been lifted, like someone gave me permission and that's what it was like for me. It was really, really scary when I think about it now. I still have cell memory for it. I had to work, do a lot of trauma work on myself to, to work through that cell memory. But um, that was valid, validation, and that was my catalyst. And um, by whatever your belief you want to put out there, uh, Jeremy was his name, and his father were looking for me, and they couldn't find me, and it just hit him out of nowhere where to go, and they found me. And I was not any place of a residence or anything like that. So it was thought out precise. I had peace, clarity. It seemed very uh, logical, rational. It was very lethal, very powerful. Somehow found transport to the hospital, Jenny Edmondson. And um, I went to the ER, and I didn't know this up until two years ago when I was talking to Jeremy, and I said, you know, I really, I need some more clarification about my attempt and what that was like for you. I want some more feedback. And we had a long discussion. He goes, well, he goes, you know that the ER told us that they were surprised you were alive. And I was like, oh, really? Well, I knew it was very serious because I spent some time in the ICU. But um, he's like, yeah, he goes, ER told us when we got there that if you would have been found five, ten more minutes anymore, you would have went to cardiac arrest. I was like, oh, okay. So for me, that was a very, um, I guess, humbling piece of information that I didn't know up until two years ago. So that's been fun trying to process all that. Um, but anyway, I woke up alive, surprisingly, um, in the ICU. And I just want to give some insight of what that could be like for someone. 
So I woke up and I was studying psychology. Everyone knew I wanted to be a helper. Everyone knew I wanted to go into this field. I actually got my notes from the psychiatrist at the time. And I looked at all of his, but he kept saying, she's a very bright and intelligent girl studying psychology, but da 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 And I was like, oh, Lord. So um, uh, I woke up angry. I was pissed. I cried when I woke up in the ICU because I was not dead. That is a brain change, okay? That is a condition that has changed the way you think because that is not normal thinking. Suicide is not a normal reaction to stressors, okay? That's why the condition is very um, important to think about. I had feelings of depression magnified. I was resentful. I was humiliated. I had tons of shame, tons of shame. How I was found, who was involved, how scary that must have been for my family, uh, because I was supposed to be dead. I wasn't supposed to be dealing with this aftermath, right? I was in a mental fog for quite a few days, kind of going through the motions. I'm sure many of you have seen that. If any of you worked psych and patient, I definitely put on a face, and I was still contemplating suicide. This is something that I want all of you to take as medical staff. Two weeks or up to a month after hospitalization for a suicide attempt is highest risk for dying by suicide. So... One month of discharge after a suicide attempt, highest risk for dying by suicide. And unfortunately, I saw that a lot when I worked inpatient. We would have patients come in, have an attempt, and we would hear about them dying about a month or two later of suicide. Very common. The risk is not over. Most people are still having those thoughts. Inpatient is not enough time to get rid of those thoughts. Most people lie to you. (laughs) Yes? Mm-hmm. Yes. I, no, I said, I, I said no. I lied. Yeah, because I want to get out of there. Because there's shame and stigma. You know what I needed to do? I need to get back to school. I did not need to get back to school. So um, I think that's something that we definitely need to keep in mind. My defining moment was um, sat down with the psychiatrist at the time. I, that was a while ago, right, when you actually went to the psychiatrist's office. Things have changed. Usually they're wheeling around into each room, right? Uh, This was at a time where we actually went to their office on the unit. Um, He spoke to me and he said, well, listen here. He goes, I don't care what you believe um, or think in spirituality or whatever. He's like, he was very brash. I loved that about him. I actually admired that. He's like, I don't care what you believe or think. He goes, but I've been practicing for 35 years. And he goes, and I've never seen someone with that high of a toxicity level alive. I've seen plenty of dead people. He goes, he goes, so that should mean something to you. Get out of my office. (laughs) Okay? So that was my turning point. Did I magically start skipping down the hallway through meadows and having unicorns and said I'm all better? Not whatsoever. Okay? That took a lot of time. Um, But it definitely sparked something within myself, and I said, you know what? Um, You made it. You're here. You're not supposed to be, but you're here. You need to do something with it. Okay? That is definitely something that um, caused me to attain wellness. It wasn't easy. I had to sort out school. I had to basically go crawling back to my program and beg for them to take me back, show that I was fit for the program. Um, I had to catch up on a lot of classes. I had to take a lot of summer school, and I had to go an extra semester. So that was hard. You know, your pride is bruised. A lot of people think, oh, there's another crazy person trying to be a therapist. We've heard that, right? We get that. Um, So that was very real. Um, Oh, okay. Thanks for the warning. Um, uh, I started to begin think, taking therapy more seriously. Uh, first of all, that took me a while. It was hard to find a good therapist that I liked. Um, so I would encourage anyone who's experienced this to um, keep, keep trying. I met um, some really not-so-great therapists. I mean, I had a therapist say, well, you know, Sierra, if you want to kill yourself, um, I can't stop you. Probably not best practice. 
Might want to work on that. I had someone who said, um, well, you know, let's just talk about your sexual abuse because that's what's causing all these problems. Sure, that might be part of it, but don't say that to a client. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of things that went wrong for me, but I finally found a, um, a therapist. She was fabulous, did good work. Medication. Medication was horrible. Trying to find the right fit. And our poor patients and clients who fight the good fight and keep trying. That is so hard. The symptoms that they, the side effects that they give you, um, things that just don't work, things that make it worse, so hard. So I was thankful to finally find something decent. And then basic self-care, okay? We've talked a little bit about that. Um, I, what we know, I'm going to skip over that. But what can I do for someone who's just attempted? I think that's the hardest part. Like, what do I do? So don't do what my family did and avoid. Okay? So um, my family was pissed. They were highly disappointed in me. They had a lot of strong feelings about the issue of suicide. Um, I grew up in a family where if you were depressed, you didn't have enough to do. Right? That's a very held value in the Midwest. Um, so for me, there's a lot of shame. And my mother, my father, my sister, my brother all refused to come see me when I was in ICU in psych. Refused to come see me. And they hadn't seen me in months because they were teaching me a lesson. You hurt me because you were being selfish. You want attention, you're not going to get it. Okay? The only people who came to see me was my stepfather, who's always been my rock, the boyfriend, and my nephew. My nephew's been more like my little brother. We're only five years apart. So those people were integral to me be getting well, and I'm so thankful for that. Um, listen, validate, drop judgment. I know that's hard, but try not to judge. Some may feel embarrassed, shame, guilty. Talk about it. That must have been really scary for you. Do you want to talk about it? Um, if you know something, educate. Educate a family about it. Tell them about the condition and catalyst. I do that a lot with families because I have families come in and say, he killed himself because she divorced him. She treated him terrible. Oh, that sounds really awful. And I'm sure that divorce was devastating for him. But I bet if we take a moment and we look at how he was living his life, he probably struggled with a lot of other things that made it difficult for him to cope with this divorce. Okay, So educating families about that. Connect, connect, connect. Number one protective factor of not dying by suicide is feeling connected. That's why they always say one, one adult who cares about a child, right, a student, really can save a life. Feeling connected, feeling like they, they belong, like someone cares. Being gentle. Continue suicide assessment. The threat is not over. Okay, a lot of people just want to get out of inpatient. They're not home. We want to get out of the hospital. Good discharge planning. Talk to family and patients about mental health as you would physical. I had a, um, a family counsel counselor ask my mom, if Sierra was diagnosed with leukemia, would you be having these same feelings? That was really eye-opening for my mother. She was absolutely not. She was, okay. Well, this is outside of her control. So... Um, I think talking about mental health just as we would about physical health and changing that language of commit to helps us have that better, that conversation. So things that you can say. People like things that we can say, right? These are tools. We like tools. Um, you're not alone in this. I'm here for you. Or thanks for telling me that. I'm really glad that you decided to talk to me. Um, I understand you have a real diagnosis. That's what causes thoughts or feelings. Please don't say that if you don't know if they have a diagnosis. <laughs> <laughs> um, I may not understand exactly how you feel, but I care and want to help you. 
You're important to me. Your life is important to me. I don't know how many times I've said that genuinely to a client and a client has said no one's ever said I'm important to them. Um, Tell me what I can do now to help you. I'm here for you. We'll get through this together. Don't say these things. (laughs) Um, It's all in your head. We all go through times like this. Buck up. Uh, you'll be fine. Stop worrying. Look on the bright side. Snap out of it. Stop acting crazy. What's wrong with you? But this is all well-meaning, this last one, well-meaning, but shaming, okay? You have so much to live for. Why would you want to die? Or why would you want to do that to your children? Ugh, I hear that one a lot. I can guarantee that person doesn't want to do that to their children, doesn't want to do that to their family. They genuinely think that they're going to be better off without that person in their lives. Okay, so well-meaning, and I hear people with the best heart say this, but it's really shaming. People want to throw that back and say, yeah, I don't know why. Why do I want to, why do, I want to do that? So um, it's confusing. Resources. Yeah, anyone need to do resources? Good practice. Um, questions. I went right up to time. I had a lot to say. I'm so sorry. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so drug use, I, over half, like half of people who died by suicide had a substance in their system. Um, and usually it's, it's used to numb before they complete um, because they're feeling a certain kind of way and they know they get braver, right? We get braver when we're using things. Um, but uh, I, I don't like to say that certain substances cause suicidal ideation, but I do have a strong opinion <laughs> about uh, THC definitely having some psychotic hallucinogen components that cause people to feel disconnected from reality and cause people to get very scared during that point and to do things they would not otherwise do being connected to reality. Same with bath salts, spices, um, any other sort of hallucinogen or a drug that causes a psychosis feeling. Um, Lots of people die by suicide or um, have homicidal ideation when they're in that psychotic trance. So yes, I do believe that if we're altering the brain that much, it definitely contributes to people dying by suicide. I've known lots of people who were actively psychotic due to a bath salt, K2, whatever, and, and killed themselves. And their parents are devastated because they, they know in their hearts that if they weren't using that substance, they'd still be alive. And I would probably agree with them. But I also agree that there were probably some other things going on, too. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, especially as a caregiver, I, I see other conversations that they have with other people. Yeah. And then they say, no, I'm not. But yeah. I know 30 minutes ago they were. But yeah. Like, you know they're lying. Sometimes I feel like we know they're lying. Yeah. So we have no sight in it, and we're so limited. Yeah. Right, right. Um, you know, I, 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 yeah, I definitely hear you on that in that um, I've seen that too. Um, I'm lucky enough to like, with, oh, sorry, that's very bright. Um, when I'm with my clients, I can, when I don't have a good feeling, I can sit with them and be like, you know, 
I know you're telling me you're not suicidal, but I have a feeling that maybe that's not the whole truth. And I have the resources, time, and ability to sit with my clients longer and develop a really thorough safety plan. You know, like this is what we're going to do. And you're going to check in with me at 8 a.m. in the morning and then noon, and then we're going to have a follow-up appointment. Like I have that ability, but hospitals, right, it's limited. So I would just encourage, and it's usually social workers, right, and hopefully they're getting trained by me <laughs> um, at school social work, on how to make really detailed, solid safety plans. Even if someone is lying, then maybe they have a resource, they have an idea, they have a plan. What do I do when I leave this place? Um, but yes, uh, that needs to change. A lot needs to change when it comes to psychiatric care. I just feel like I, I, I take it home. Absolutely. Know, I worry so much, like, oh, you just keep this person out. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like, I'm not saying we don't care, but, mm -hmm. but you know what happens. Yeah. And it's like, I know, I know something is still wrong. Yeah. And it's like, what? I can't do anything. Right. But, yeah. Absolutely. And I also think that uh, the art of follow-up has died. Um, and so I really wish that uh, social work had more freedom and resources and things to follow up with people. Um, and that can save a life because the risk isn't over. So I, I definitely wish that uh, that could be part of treatment more so. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's like, I don't know any of the story that, like, what happened. I don't know um, what they've been going through. Mm -hmm. And half the time, they're just like, they just want pay because they just want out. They want help, but we don't have the help to give them. Right. So it's hard to find the words to say, I'm here to listen to you. And half the time, they're just like, I, I don't want to talk because sure. I actually want to be there. Sure. Sure, I know, and, and you know, that sounds like a system issue that um, we need to find a way to better connect those people and get them to someone that they can talk to. Um, but I can assure you that most people who die by suicide don't do it when someone else is around. So um, always keeping that in mind um, that when people are alone and in their homes, uh, the risk goes up significantly. So even if they're sitting there pacing, and saying, I want someone to help me, to me, I think that's more of a protective factor than saying, well, I can't, you know, so peace. Um, I, I do think that there's got to be a better system put in place. And that's, that's hard. That's hard when um, mental health funding's been so drastically cut, not prioritized. Um, and there's just not the support there to do it. So I don't know, maybe you should get your social workers to do a little bit of lobbying and... Uh, Yeah. It's sometimes you can build a great relationship and you can have great conversations, but then yeah. other times they're just kind of going over their thoughts. Yeah. Well, if Methodist ever wants to train their care companions or people on crisis intervention and just triage, mental health triage, um, let me know. I mean, for real. I mean, because sometimes if we don't have the funding, we've got to find ways to, you know, so if people are feeling that way, I think that's important to listen to. And then um, we can maybe reduce, reduce people feeling lost and unheard and even reduce suicide. 
Um, if we just, tr simple, you don't have to be some amazing therapist to do some basic crisis intervention, some just mental health triage, make people feel supported and feel like they weren't just thrown in a room and forgotten about. I think that's a lot of what yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of feel like you're tiptoeing around everything. Yeah. You don't want to say the wrong thing to trigger them. Yeah. 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 And I hear that a lot. Mm -hmm. I definitely hear that a lot. Like I don't know what to say. What? So yeah. We can probably take one more question. Yeah. Sarah. Mm -hmm. Is there any other single time that mm -hmm. that you deal with it? Because I pay attention to those. Keep writing down things on what you see. Mm -hmm. Cause that's what it's going to take. Yeah, absolutely. I just so, have a, oh, oh. I more yeah. Yeah. personal because I have a college student. Yeah. Did your friends yeah. or professors or anybody recognize and reach out to the family, or just you know, because you always worry about your children at college, mm -hmm. and you wonder if people will reach out if they notice, because you know. Yeah, yeah um, I would, I mean, Jeremy, my boyfriend at the time, definitely told my f family that s there's something going on. Um, I think my family just felt, what can we do? Um, she's four hours away. Uh, keep us updated, you know, that type of thing. I think my stepdad offered to come down and take me home, you know, a couple of times. But what college student is going to be like, yeah, that sounds great. Um, <laughs> uh, so I wasn't ready there. You know, I wasn't to that point yet. When I came back for spring break, I, I probably would have taken him up on that. But um yeah, I think, I don't think people just completely ignored me, but I think people were like, oh, you know, just a college student who's out of control and doesn't know what's going on. And, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Should you yank that kid back from college? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, you just need to get them a more stable, you know, um, stability. And I recognized that. I was able to be like, you know, I don't think I should go back to school. Um, but being supportive in that, we, we know you want to finish college, and we will help you do that. Um, but if you need to come home and just get well, we want that for you too. Like if someone would have said that to me and reframed it <laughs> for me, because I was very all or nothing thinking. I was like, it's either you power through or you're dropping out of college, which isn't realistic, you know. I, and I wasn't thinking clearly, though, either. I was not logical. And um, if someone would have just been like, you know, Sierra, let's just take a break. Just come home. Yeah, we will get classes sorted out. I'll advocate for you. And when you're feeling well enough, we'll get you right back into classes again. Someone would have reframed that. I think I would have taken the bait. But it was for me, it was all or nothing. So I think sometimes we just need that rational mind, gentle, rational mind. Yes, thank you so much. Sorry for going over your time. Yes, thank you.